So listen to God's word. I encourage you to follow along in the text. You can see that the prologue is 18 verses. It's broken up into three parts, the first four verses. And then he has this middle section on, the, on the John the Baptist as a witness. And then he goes back in verse 14 to this, the word. So listen to God's word to you. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, once again, we come before you asking your inspiration for us, for our eyes to see deeper than the words on a page, but to see the word, the one from the very beginning, the one named Jesus Christ. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So of the four Gospels that we have, you remember that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels. Sin meaning together and optic being to see. So they're seeing together something similarly. There is no way that you or I can confuse that John is like the others seen together. He sees from a wholly different perspective of Jesus Christ. Many events in John are not found in the others. Most events in John are in Jerusalem. The events of the others are mostly up in Galilee, north of Jerusalem. If others are focused on Jesus, the parables, and the narrative description, John focuses on metaphors and on what are some obscure spiritual discussions. The kingdom of God is mentioned 75 times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and many times described in interesting parables. John mentions kingdom of God twice. 
because what he's interested in more is the person of Jesus Christ. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John calls people to believe and then to follow him. In John, Jesus calls people not only to believe in him, but to abide in him. So often you hear that the believer's prayer is to ask Jesus to come into my life. But John would say, not exactly. Jesus is inviting you to come into his life. So with John as our study for scriptures for the next several weeks, let's begin our journey of Lent to the cross and to the empty tomb, seeing Jesus in all his glory, the light dispelling darkness, darkness not only in the world, but even in our lives as well. And so we go at the very start to John's prologue. Now, my favorite Bible teacher of all times is Dale Bruner. And Dale Bruner, just last year, finished what he'd been working on off and on for 30 years, a 1,300-page commentary on the Gospel of John. Now, Reverend Juarez and I went to Princeton just so we could hear Dale Bruner last year. And he lectured on this event that he took to heart to write this commentary. He was the alumnus of the year and 50 years of ministry, just an amazing man. He begins this commentary in this way. One feels on holy ground when entering the prologue of this gospel. Here we have the overture to the symphony of the whole gospel, the preface to the greatest story ever told, the introduction to history's central fact, the foreword to the last word, and the preamble to the realities most trusted by the worldwide church. From the very first three words, you know you are in for a biblical showdown in this gospel. Anyone who would begin their writing with words as famous then and now as in the beginning has an unparalleled spiritual agenda. Everyone with an ounce of religious background knows these words from the opening verses of the book of Genesis which bears their meaning. And this is no accident. John has a plan. Bruner says, Gen the Genesis text begins with God doing something. In the beginning, God made. John begins with a divine being. In the beginning was. The gospel writer here is assuming to go behind and beyond even creation to what and to who preceded it. Now it's somewhat audacious to assume what was going on, scientists say, 14 billion years ago at creation. It's even more presumptive to claim to know what was already there in the beginning. Except that the church has always given two reasons why John can write these words. One, he writes from the words and deeds of his gospel subject, Jesus Christ. And two, he writes from the promised gift of the Holy Spirit, which is why we affirm that the Bible is inspired word. So from the very beginning, capital B, and the beginning, little b, of this gospel, we are introduced to this mysterious title, The Word, which as you probably remember is called Logos in Greek. In the beginning was the Word, Logos. And the Word was with God, 
and the Word was God. Now later we find out that this Word is a who, not a what. But for now we are introduced to a commonly known word in Greek. It comes from the root of logic or logical, and it can mean, usually can mean just simply a word about. And so we put it at the end of many of our words, biology, a, a word of life, or theology, a word about God. But it can also actually go much further than that, and it encompasses a broader meaning conveying knowledge and wisdom and reason and revelation. And in our context, readers would see this word as the mind and heart of God, something powerful as when God spoke and creation happened. In Genesis, God said, let there be light, and so light appeared, and God saw that the light was good. Most early readers of this, philosophers and theologians, they wouldn't have a problem with this description so far. Even all the way up to verse 14. But that's where the sparks would fly. That's where John makes a previously unheard of claim. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Now, literally, in the Greek, this word means he pitched his tent, dwelt. He, he made his home among us. Uh, Eugene Peterson of the Message says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood. As Adam Hamilton, the one who's study we're going to use describes it. In other words, as John begins his gospel in the life of Jesus, he is telling us that God's heart, mind, reason, logic, will, and desire to reveal himself to the human race have been wrapped in human flesh and have come to us as a person, Jesus Christ. The very mind that ordered and brought forth creation took on flesh and spoke to humanity in and through Jesus Christ. Now, this is why so often you hear this text used during Advent and in particularly on Christmas Eve because it describes in the most powerful way in the Bible the incarnation, God becoming human. This is so important to John that he repeats it again. And he gives a name to this word in verse 17, Jesus Christ. And sharing his thesis or his main theme in verse 18, the last verse of the prologue, which is a theme that we will find all through his gospel. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is Himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made Him known. And so for the next 21 chapters, He drives home this theme. It's the person that matters, not the details, the rules, the laws, or the belief system. Notice that He doesn't tell you how all this happened. He tells you when in the beginning was the Word. He tells you where and the Word was with God. He tells you who and the Word was God. But John does not tell you the how. He is more concerned that you and I know that Jesus embodies the very Word of God. And when John writes about the Word of God, he's not defining a book. He is emphatically, unequivocally describing the person, Jesus Christ. And John summarizes this at the, at the very end of his book when he says in chapter 20, But these words are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, 
and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Over and over, John will keep saying and giving examples of how Jesus points to who God is and what God is like. Want to know the nature of God as we discussed last week? Then look at Jesus. When you pray to God, picture Jesus. Want to abide in God? Abide in Jesus. We come to know who God is by looking at Jesus. Or to put it another way, by seeing Jesus in all his glory is like looking into the face of God. So this first theme that John emphasizes right out of the gates is the Word. Made flesh, Jesus Christ, who came into this world. Now two other themes that you're going to see all through this gospel are light and life. Light from that verse. What came into being through the Word was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't extinguish it. Now, in the Gospel of John, darkness is a metaphor, and it is used both for spiritual blindness, that you and I might be in the dark, and we just don't understand a spiritual truth, or it could be a metaphor of evil in the world, that there is darkness in the world, and this light overcomes the darkness. And John wants us to understand when he talks about light all through the gospel that Jesus Christ dispels all of this darkness, both the darkness in the world and those dark corners that are in our souls. Now, John also has a theme of life, and these two are intertwined. In John's prologue, light leads to life. New life, abundant life, resurrection life. Life is what our faith is all about in Jesus Christ. Now, today, and forever, for eternity. John uses the word life 47 times in his gospel. And most of the time it is Jesus using the word and he's speaking it as a life that he offers to us. Most of the time Jesus is describing this life as eternal life. And of course, the most famous time he uses this word is that gospel in a nutshell of John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. Now, unlike most people who hear these words, John does not mean just life after death. He means right now. You see, for John, eternal life begins today, right now, for you and for me. Living life today in a way that doesn't fear what happens in the future. Living our lives as those who are prepared to die so that in our dying, we might go on living. We live differently now because we know that death is not the end. Now this is what each of us are encouraged to, each one is encouraged to contemplate, reflect upon, and, and act upon during Lent. Journeying with Jesus these 40 days, all the way to the cross, knowing that the cross and death of Good Friday is overcome by the empty tomb and the resurrected life of Easter Sunday. Now this is the hope that John says that each of us can have. Seeing Jesus in all of his glory. May it be so for each one. Amen.